And, uh, based, and, and are you aware of the fact that based on the study uh, that uh, resulted in the showing of the location of the president and the government we've just seen before, that this is the conclusion uh, of the line of the, that the bullet uh, was fo uh, following when it struck the president, that the House committee reached? The, the, Do you know that this is what they concluded? Is that correct? That that's what they true. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. The House committee concluded that. Yes. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to have to just uh, conclude by putting a couple of uh, exhibits in here. I'd like the exhibit number 100, please. <clears throat> this is an extremely poor picture. Uh, unfortunately, we tried to get uh, the original pictures from the uh, archives and were not able uh, to do so. <clears throat> Uh, would you give this to Dr. Weck, please? <clears throat> but let me indicate what is shown here. This has uh, already been uh, uh, been shown, I think. This is a uh, this is a Pruder film. <clears throat> it's frame 210 up here in the left. <clears throat> the one on the right shows the, the position of the limousine that was used in the Warren Commission reenactment, uh, corresponding to the Zapruder uh, frame 210. And the picture in the lower left here is. Uh, is what the assassin would have seen from the window. And I, when this was explained before, it was a little confusing, I think. Certainly, there was nobody up there taking pictures at the time uh, uh, the shot, shots were fired, but these pictures were taken by the FBI during the Warren Commission reenactment. <clears throat> if you look at that picture closely, the crosshairs that was taken through the, through the crosshairs of the telescopic site, and it comes right in on the president's back, does it not, Dr. Weck? Yes. And if you look right in front of the president, you'll see Governor Connolly turn sharply to his right. No, sir, that's not correct. He's not correct. He's not. Well, he's I'll tell not, you what we'll do. He's not right in front of the president. He's he's to the <laughs> left. He's in front and to the left. Right. If if the if Governor Connolly was sitting in the position as shown in this picture, the bullet could have gone through the president and into Governor Connolly's right arm. No, sir. Right. Not into the right <clears throat> posterior axillary. Even with this reenactment, if you okay. draw the straight line, you'll see that it is to the left of what the I, right armpit. What I want to do is put this so that you all can see this, the jury can see this. I want to put it down here. Actually, I'll pass it around. So if Dr. Biden would get that picture and give it to the jury and pass it around so they can look at it, I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> um, okay, one more question. Right? Would you show Dr. Uh, Dr. Weck this picture? We don't have this picture. We got it too late from the archives to uh, put it on the materials here. <clears throat> and I'll ask you to look at that picture, Dr. Wecht, and, <clears throat> and ask you if it shows, uh, I'll represent to you that it shows a, uh, <clears throat> our inspector uh, with a rod passing <clears throat> close to the president's body and into Governor Connolly's back that was taken immediately after the reenactment in a garage. And just to ask you the question, the judge is allowing me one more question. <clears throat> If uh, the position of the men had been in that, if the men had been in that position, then the bullet could have gone through the president and hit the governor, could it not? It gone through the president, hit the governor? <coughs> that's yes, the question, yes. Dr. Weck, that's the yeah, question. The, the answer is, yeah, yes, that's right. right. Thank yeah. you. I hope so. <coughs> I, I want to put two things in. I want to put two things in, uh, uh, in, in uh, evidence, if I may, Your Honor. Exhibit 130. Just pass those around if you would, Dr. Biden. I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> um, exhibit 130 uh, represents uh, his findings, summary of the findings of the photographic evidence panel. <clears throat> and I'll place these out here so that they can be, the jury can examine them later. And also 129, <clears throat> uh, which they're going to have to speak for themselves at this point because the judge is going to make me sit down. But let me summarily tell you what they show. <clears throat> they show that the president was leaning forward at the time he was hit between 11 and 18 degrees <clears throat> relative to a line perpendicular to the road. That the road had a downward slope of three degrees <clears throat> and that uh, adjusting the entrance and exit wounds in the president's body <clears throat> to conform with the position that he was in, there was a downward slope through the president's body of four degrees. That is to say that the wound in the back was higher than the wound in the front. So we have a downward slope of four degrees. <clears throat> Dr. Wecht has talked, you've talked, talked about an upward slope, but the fi findings of the photographic panel here are that there was a downward degree, downward slope through the president's body of four degrees, a downward slope on the road of three degrees, which is 10 degrees, 
and a downward slope, a forward slope, and the president leaning forward from 11 to 18 degrees, <coughs> which gives us a, uh, a uh, relationship of uh, 18 to 25 degrees of the president with respect to the trajectory, and the trajectory itself was 21 degrees, so it falls right within the middle. <coughs> I'm sorry that I ran out of time, but I got involved with the head wound, and I didn't really intend to do that. All right, thank you, Mr. Liebler, and thank you, uh, Dr. Weck, very that, much for your work. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'll give you one question to redirect. That's all I can give you. We're really short of time. Dr. Weck, did Dr. Sturdivant do any tests to establish that CD399 could have been the super bullet? Could have been what? The super bullet that did the super bullet therapy. No, to my knowledge, uh, he did not. <coughs> Dr. Blakey began with a short introductory statement. Mr. Liebler will then be given approximately 15 minutes uh, to discuss the acoustic evidence. Dr. Blakely will be given the same, and then we'll have Mr. Liebler return with a short closing statement. So first, of course, going to recognize Dr. Blakey to give some foundation information about the acoustics evidence. This is like 50 seconds uh, on the acoustics. Let me set it up in the following way. This is Dealey Plaza. You've seen it to the point of uh, nausea. Uh, this is Maine, Houston, and Elm. Uh, this is a representation of three shots from the depository. The basic argument turns on whether there's a shot from this area coming this direction, from the grassy knoll. I'm going to talk to you later about certain events, and what I want to do is point to you in the places where they are. This is the area where Bill and Gail Newman were standing. I want to turn it on. This is the area where S.M. Holland was standing. Uh, you will see in the film from time to time a police officer by the name of H.B. McLean come around this point, and you'll see him coming here, you'll see him turning, and you'll see him ultimately here. The problem, if you will, in the acoustics is that we were told on the committee that the Dallas PD tape uh, was captured during the period of the assassination. This conspiracy theorists uh, thought that what, what this was an effort to block the communications channel. Well, if the tape was running during the time of the assassination, this gave us a chance to get a recording of the assassination. So we went out and made an effort to find uh, the tape recording. The tape recording turns out to be two dicta belts and a tape. Uh, we sent the two dicta belts and a tape up to Bolt, Brannick, and Newman in uh, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, give me a little qualification for them. Uh, they did the work on uh, the Zurich's missing tape, the time on the, the Nixon's tape. They also did the study of uh, Kent State, where the uh, officer was who shot the students. Uh, and they were recommended to us, and they were number one, the Acoustical Society of America, to come in and look at it. What they did is they analyzed the tape, and they came up, and they said, and this is a, a gross oversimplification, that there were five areas on the tape that they thought might be gunshots. Uh, and, but the only way they could tell us whether they were or not is if we went down to the plaza and fired rifles in the plaza, so we'd have something to match it off against. The difficulty for us is we didn't know where the motorcycle was. We knew where the possible locations of the gunshots were, but we did not know where the motorcycle was. So we reconstructed uh, uh, a test. And what we did is we set microphones every 18 feet along this line in order to get shots. Unfortunately, this builds into our ability to match a plus or minus 18. Uh, we took the, uh, the matches out. We came up with a match, a series of matches. The, the only match that, for, for present purposes, that counts is the shot from the grassy knoll. It turns out to be a probability of 50-50. We then went into phase two of the study, uh, and we made an effort to do an analytical reconstruction of the shot from the grassy knoll to see if we could increase the degree of, of, of confidence in it. This is basically the wave form sounds of a, of a, of a shot. 
what this represents is a graph that gives you two things, amplitude in this direction and time in this direction. When a echo occur or shot occurs, what we hear is this. What actually occurs is this. Uh, that can be represented in this. Assuming a shot from the grassy knoll, you have a direct, and it's a supersonic shot, you have a supersonic shock wave going directly from it to the microphone. You then have a muzzle blast going directly from the gun to the microphone. You then have echoes off principal locations. And what you end up doing is if you know the temperature of the air and the speed of, of sound, you get a relatively fixed range within which these distances can be measured out. And that's preci precisely what this is an effort to do. This is the shot allegedly from the grassy knoll. You can see in the front here, it has an indication of an N wave, meaning there was a supersonic passage through the air before the bullet uh, muzzle blast ero arose. This is the muzzle blast, and these are echoes. And you can identify in these, or at least our people thought they could identify, the physical features in Dealey Plaza that was represented by this. And they were able to do that because we actually had fired shots in Dealey Plaza, and we knew what the echo structure of those shots were. And the question is, how close a match could we get from the echo structure of, on the tape against our own shots? The conclusion in 1979 was that this represented to a 95 degree of confidence. Uh, now, understand, that's a 5% degree of lack of confidence, a shot from the grassy knoll. We asked uh, the NSF panel, or we asked the Department of Justice to ask that further studies be done on this, because obviously we were running out of time and money, uh, and if we were not a congressional committee but a scientific body, we would have done considerably more study. We asked the Department of Justice to take a look at it, and I think what we'll hear now from Professor Liebler is what he thinks the NSF panel uh, showed. The House Committee concluded that certain impulse patterns in the waveforms made of this Dallas police recording from the open, mic open microphone on the motorcycle represented shots fired during the assassination, as Professor Blakey has just told you. <clears throat> there were no sounds. We have the tape here, and I'm going to play it for you, parts of it. I'll play the whole thing if you want to hear it. <clears throat> the tape, the, uh, there was no sound whatever on the, on the tape that even remotely resembles shots. <clears throat> the House Committee's explanation is that the Dallas police radio equipment designed primarily for voice transmission would not faithfully record the sound of such a loud and intrusive event as a gunshot. James C. Bowles, of whom more in a moment, who was the Dallas Police Department officer in charge of the dispatchers at the time of the assassination and is presently sheriff of Dallas County, Texas, would testify, if here, that the Dallas Police Department radio system in place in 1963 would have recorded the sounds of the shots not just these inaudible waveforms. They're, they're not, they're, 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 you, there's something on the tape that is transmitted, translated by Blakey's experts into waveforms of the type that he showed you. But there's nothing on the tape relating to them or even not relating to them that sounds like shot. <clears throat> Bowles would testify that the equipment in use in 1963 would have recorded the sounds of the shots if they had been fired within 300 feet of the open mic, which is absolutely essential for their theory. The, mi the microphone had to be that close. They say that it was closer. He would testify the sound recorded on the police department tape would have been quite similar to the, to the same sound that would be heard over a regular telephone equipment. So when you think about this, just imagining, imagine somebody firing a shot at the, at, at the other end of a telephone line and asking yourself what you would hear. You certainly wouldn't hear anything like what, appear, what, what appears on this tape that Professor Blakey wants us to believe are shots. 
In addition to that, Bowles would testify that during the reconstruction that Blakey just described to us, when all these test firings were made, <clears throat> Dallas Police Department equipment that was similar to that which was in, the, in, the, in the use in 1963, clearly received the sound of all test shots and recorded them audibly and easily recognizable as shots. And that's a quote from Bowles. Why are there no sounds of shots on the tape? The answer is simple. Because the microphone was not in Dealey Plaza. It was not in any place where it could have received sounds of shots fired at the time of the assassination. All of the fancy graphs and technical conversation that Bob Blakey is going to give us today to the contrary notwithstanding. <clears throat> this was not a minor problem, and it was raised at the time. Sheriff Bowles tried to get the House Committee to focus specifically on the question of where this microphone, where this, where this uh, motorcycle was, <clears throat> but it was never really done. After they had done this acoustical test, they had to go out and find a, a motorcycle. They had some pictures that showed a motorcycle, lots of motorcycles in the plaza. They picked this poor guy, McLean, and claimed that his microphone was open. They brought McLean back to Washington and took his testimony, and you ought to read it. It's very interesting. The only thing they ever asked him was whether he thought his microphone was open. They never asked him that. <clears throat> when he went back to Dallas and found out what the House Committee was proposing to do with his testimony, he immediately <clears throat> uh, announced that it was not possible for his microphone to have been open, <clears throat> and he was not the motorcycle officer who recorded <clears throat> these sounds. Passing over the problem that there's nothing that sounds like shots on the tape, the House Committee conclusion cannot stand, obviously, unless the motorcycle with the open microphone was in Dealey Plaza when the shots were fired. And two, the impulse patterns were recorded at the time the shots were fired. <clears throat> and Mr. Blakey and my colleagues on the other side of this case have got the burden of proof on both those questions. Were you there in 82? I was there. Were you there in 82? I was no. there for the catch. Oh, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. Uh, I'll wait till today. When he yeah. caught the I mean, pass. I mean, next week. When he caught the pass, I was uh, in the press box, and I almost got uh, very Runs pretty constantly, and it sounds, if you listen to it, like it's running at about, Bowles estimates, 25 to 30 miles an hour. Well, during this time, McLean's motorcycle was in the motorcade, which is moving down Main Street in Dallas, where the crowds were pressing in on the motorcade from both sides. The motorcade was going on an average speed of two to four miles an hour during that period of time, actually stopped at least three or four times, and the crowd was screaming and yelling, and you can hear all those noises in the Channel 2 tape. There's two tapes here, okay? The Channel 1 tape, where the microphone was stuck open, and the Channel 2 tape, <clears throat> that was used by the motorcade, and there were lots of transcriptions or transmissions from Chief Curry's car, which was in the motorcade, and when Chief Curry on Channel 2, and when Chief Curry talks <clears throat> when the motorcade is going down Main Street in Dallas from inside of his car, you can hear the sounds of the crowd yelling and screaming along the side. And if I hadn't already taken so much time, and if the judge weren't glaring at me like he is, <clears throat> I'd play that for you, but I'll pass over that, and you accept my word for it for the moment, but if you don't want to accept my word for it, it's on the tape, and I'll play it for you later hopefully on Professor Blakey's time. <clears throat> now, after the engine noise subsides, we have some loud clicks and pops for about 10 seconds. And these are what Bob Blakey believes are gunshots, even though they sound more like static. <clears throat> most, most importantly, from the timing standpoint, which is what I want to address first, is that these shots, the fourth one, was accompanied <clears throat> by <clears throat> an audible uh, an audible, and this was known by the house acoustic experts, by an audible but not intelligible, was unintelligible, nobody could figure out what the voice said, <clears throat> that was laid in there at the same time at 145 seconds into the tape, which was the time of the fourth shot, according to the house committee, there's this voice in the background, but nobody can figure out what it was. Now what I'm going to do first is just play this tape starting at about 100 seconds into the tape. <clears throat> the motorcycle slows <clears throat> a, a bit later, and then when, when, the, when the counter gets to the point where the House Committee shots start, I'll raise my hand, and you can listen for the shots, and when the shot time period is over, I'll drop it. So that's when the shot period <clears throat> ends. That's the motorcycle.
going two to four miles an hour in the motorcade. Listen to it. It'll slow in a few seconds. It's starting to slow. Here's the shot. Shots are over. And you can see there are other cracks and snaps and popples in there as it goes along. <clears throat> After, now focus, focusing first on the timing question, an amateur musician, a whole study was made of this house effort by a committee of experts appointed by the <clears throat> National Academy of Sciences at the quest of quest, first of the House Committee, then of the Justice Department. <clears throat> An amateur musician <clears throat> in Mansfield, Ohio, by the name of Steve Barber, was listening to this tape on a little plastic disc, disc that he got in a Rolling Stone magazine or some such thing. And he said that he could hear this unintelligible voice that I mentioned that came right at this time of the last shot, 145 seconds. Barber said he could hear the words, hold everything. And he wrote to Norman Ramsey, who was in the Harvard University Physics Department suggesting that the word hold everything, words hold everything were in there. And Barber suggested that those words hold everything were part of a transmission that came over channel two in which the sheriff, Sheriff Decker, was telling his men to run over to the school book depository into the railroad tracks and to hold everything secure until the homicide investors, investigators could get there. That created a problem because that transmission was made by Sheriff Decker 64 seconds after, Cap after Chief Curry of the Dallas Police Department had ordered the motorcade to go to Parkland Hospital following the assassination. If that piece of evidence held up, it would turn out that these noises that the House Committee believed were shots were recorded over a minute after the assassination had ended and the motorcade was on its way to Parkland Hospital. So what did this is called the Ballistics Acoustics Committee. We'll call it the BAC, okay? The BAC did a voice print of the segment from Sheriff Decker, Hold Everything Secure, and a voice print of the 145 second segment and compared them. And this is not just an ordinary voice print situation where I might say something today and an expert could tell it was my voice if I said something else tomorrow. These are two identical transmissions. The same voice, the same frequencies, the same times, and they match like a hand in a glove. Okay, and even BBN, both Berenack and Newman, the firm of consultants in Boston that did this work, admits that this match is an accurate and correct match. They do not deny that the hold everything on the, at the 145 second point on channel one, which is the end of Blakey's shots, <clears throat> and, the whole, and the Sheriff Decker communication that occurred a minute after the motorcade went to Parkland Hospital are the same transmissions. They are the identical transmissions. Now, in all fairness, they do not admit that that proves <coughs> that the tape, <coughs> that, that the transmission was a minute later because, for reasons that I do not know. But they have, in a letter that Professor Blakey kindly gave me, Jim Barger, the chief uh, scientist of this uh, organization, says that there are <coughs> anomalies or, or something in the tape to make him uh, suspect that this may not, in fact, uh, 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 be the uh, show that the timing question is off, but there's no question that it is the same transmission. And the unanimous uh, Ballistic Acoustics Committee, plus a special segment of it that did a study for I in IBM, is absolutely convinced conclusively that these noises that Blakey is talking about occurred more than one minute after the motorcade had already left for the hospital. Now, <clears throat> the question of where the motorcycle was. McLean, who's driving this big Harley Davidson <clears throat> down Main Street with the motorcade absolutely categorically denies that this could have been his motorcycle. He testified <clears throat> that he was parked on Houston Street, and if you look, come up there and look, there's a little pergola back there, some, <clears throat> some open uh, the, the brickwork up in the very back there at the corner of Main Street and Houston Street. <clears throat> Get this thing off, I'll go over there and, uh, and show it to you because it's worth it. McLean says, 
that he was sitting right here on Houston Street <clears throat> when he heard a first shot. He only heard one shot, and the pigeons flew up from the Texas School Book Depository Building. He didn't move. He sat there and said that he looked down through this little, these windows here, and saw the Secret Service agent jumping up on the back of the presidential limousine. That was after the third shot was fired. McLean was still back here on Houston Street. In order for this, this to have been McLean's motorcycle that was recording these, this, these noises, the microphones that produced the match are way up here in the intersection <coughs> of Houston Street and Elm Street. So that suggests in itself <coughs> that, that this was not McLean's uh, motor, motorcycle. I've lost the microphone entirely at this point. Where'd it go to? <laughs> here it is. But there's more than that. In fact, there's, <clears throat> there's two main points. The first is that the sounds we've already heard, <clears throat> and I've got to move to another tape segment here, so I'm going to move back to it as I, as I, as I talk. <laughs> Sit down, I'll Blakey. Him, I'll give him two minutes more. <laughs> two more minutes of my time. <laughs> All right. That's close enough. I'll start in a minute. There's two basic points here. The first is that the motorcycle, the noise on the tape at the beginning, when the, when the motorcycle is supposedly coming down Main Street, <clears throat> is not consistent with the sounds that were heard at that time because the motorcycle engine is going too fast and there are no crowd noises. But that's not the important point. The important point is that after the assassination, the entire motorcade including McLean, whose motorcycle was supposed to be open and recording these sounds, <clears throat> took off for Parkland Hospital, full bore in a Harley Davidson police special with sirens blaring. The whole motorcade had sirens blaring. There's no sound on the tape of sirens whatsoever at this point. There is no sound of a motorcycle engine speeding up. In fact, you can hear a motorcycle engine idling. You can hear people whistling in the background. You can hear a noise Bonk, bonk. It sounds like a motorcycle running over a grate, over a drain grate, which was present at the trademark <clears throat> where this motorcycle that was recording these events actually was. There is not the faintest notion in that tape that, there, that this microphone is with a motorcade moving to Parkland Hospital. Two minutes after the motorcade leaves, Park, leaves Dealey Plaza, we do hear sirens. And I'll just play the tape so you can hear it and draw your own conclusion. That way I can make Blakey sit down as well. I have two advantages. <clears throat> the motorcade has already left. The motorcade, according to the ballistic acoustics finding, is on its way to Dealey Plaza. <clears throat> we still have this motorcycle running along. going to hear, I mean, you'll hear it, you're going to hear sound of sirens, and you'll hear them faintly at first, and then they'll rise and get louder, reach a peak and then fade away, as though this motorcycle is going by the microphone, and the microphone is sitting still. The microphone was on the motorcycle parked at the trademark, which was about halfway between Dealey Plaza and Parkland Hospital. The motorcade went right by the trademark on its way to Parkland Hospital. <clears throat> Still got a bit to go. <clears throat> Do you hear a Harley Davidson police special roaring off to, to Parkland Hospital on this day? Do you hear any siren noises? On channel two, you can hear the sirens clearly in the police chief's car. Bonk. You can 
hear the engine speed up and then slow down and idle. Practically no engine noise at all. Professor, about two seconds. Yes, it. I have a letter in my hand that Robert Blakey wrote to James Barger on November 30th, 1981, two years after he completed this investigation, and he says, one other thing occurred to me about time. If I recall correctly, you indicated once that you could hear the motor of the motorcycle and that it might be possible analyzing its sound to estimate its speed at various points in time, or at least to tell when it, spe when it changed speed. We know from McLean's testimony and the photos that he speeded up on Houston, slowed down at the turn, went about 10 miles an hour down Elm Street, and then raced to Parkland. Should not this sequence show up on the tape? Indeed, Professor Blakey, it should. The problem is, it doesn't. Thank you. All right, I will give Professor Blakey equal time to finish his remarks. <laughs> God, no. I mean, we're not that... Until I say it's enough. Go ahead. Let me show you, yeah, if I can, uh, the basic position of the NSF panel. Uh, this is channel two, and this is channel one. Uh, channel two is the uh, Currys, the chief's broadcast. Uh, channel 1 were the uh, police officers. Uh, right about here on Channel 1 is where the four shots occur. And under approximately the third to fourth shot, uh, Decker makes the comment, and this is now uh, Sheriff Bill Decker makes a comment, hold everything. Steve Barber was able to figure out that if, if you looked over on channel one and channel two, Decker is in the same place. Accordingly, since Curry made a comment, let's go to the hospital, about 60 seconds before Decker, if these two things are identical, these are the two central propositions, if these two things are identical and, underline the word and, italicize the word and, simultaneously recorded, then the events that we analyzed, the four events, occurred 60 seconds after the assassination. And therefore, whatever they are, they're not the sounds of the assassination. There is another coordination that can be done with this tape. And one of the things that uh, Jim didn't do is explore whether there's other crosstalk on here. And I am not necessarily asserting that I believe this. I'm simply presenting to you an alternative view. Gary Mack, a researcher, made an alternative uh, analysis of it, and he does it with Belloc. It turns out that there's another place on both the tapes where Sergeant S.Q. Belloc says, do you want, etc." And it is perfectly clear that this is the same. My assumption would be is if we did a, a spectrographic analysis, we'd get it. If you coordinate Bella back, you put Decker in the last shot before Curry. What you now have to choose is between which coordination you're going to accept. If the Bella one is correct, then the Decker one here and the Decker one there was not, were not simultaneously recorded. And if they were not simultaneously recorded, uh, one of the two essential positions in 
Jim's analysis that this is not the sound of the assassination is gone. How do we figure out in the absence of additional scientific study? One of the things that really bothered me about the NSF panel is I've read scientific studies all my life. And every single one of them always ended up with the recommendation of additional study. This one recommends the following. We have conclusive evidence that Decker-Decker is the same. We think it is likely, not conclusive, that they were, not simul they were simultaneously recorded. Therefore, we conclude conclusively. Let me drop a footnote. Go back to logic. You cannot get greater certainty in a conclusion than you have in a premise. If the premise of simultaneous recording is only likely, then the only grounds on which they can sustain their position is likely, not conclusive. But in any event, they conclude because it is not likely that additional studies would change the result they recommend against them as not worth it. Now, a judgment of whether something is worth it or not is a judgment about values, and science speaks to facts, not values, at least since David Hume. What you got was a political judgment in this particular body on whether it was worthwhile doing additional studies. My own judgment is it is worthwhile doing additional studies. In the absence of additional studies, how can this jury choose between the analysis of the select committee that says these four events are the signs of the assassination and the conclusion of the NSF panel is that these are admittedly non-random events but events that occurred somewhere else. I suggest to you that the only way in which you can do that is exactly the way you do attest any other witness's credibility. You look for corroboration. If the scenario of the acoustics is corroborated substantially, it becomes therefore believable. And this is where I now raise with you the following. Jim and the NSF panel would have you believe that those four events that occurred six minutes after the assassination and are unique to this tape randomly matched the sounds of the assassination as to timing and direction. Now, let me kind of call back for you and go to the lecture uh, at lunch. Remember I suggested we have two clocks here, the clock of the film and the clock of the tape. If the clock of the film and the clock of the tape are coordinate, they corroborate one another. And for two of the events on the tape, we have immediate and direct corroboration in the film. The shot from behind that hits the president, the shot from behind that hits the president, shot number two, shot number three. Timing and direction of the film plus the, the autopsy is exactly the timing and direction on the acoustics. The one is about five seconds, the other one is about six seconds. Understand the timing on the film is based on the average running of that camera, and the time on the tape is based on a reconstruction uh, based on uh, the, the electrical hums in it. So I got two corroborations, timing and direction in the film, autopsy, and the tape. I've got a third one. Remember I suggested Governor Conley's testimony? He said he turned around and he wasn't hit by the first shot. Well, indeed, we look back in the film based on where the acoustics told us to look, and you can see Governor Conley turning around. We can see that little girl across the street. I'm not going to suggest to you that that's the kind of corroboration that's represented by shots two and four, but as to shots one, it is consistent. Now turn to the question of the shot from the grassy knoll. Is there corroboration for the shot from the grassy knoll? In the film, no. In the autopsy, no. In none of the other physical evidence is there any corroboration for it. On the other hand, it is not uncorroborated. I gave you the statistics of the witnesses, 250 people in the plaza. 20 heard shots from the grassy knoll. This is not something that stands only on the acoustics. It stands on the people who said it was there. I've reviewed for you, and, and you can take it home and look at it, and you can go read the original testimony. We have testimony of witnesses. Bill and Gail Newman, one to the left, one over their head. 
Zabruder standing with the film. One could have been anywhere, but the other one was all around me and was different. We've got S.M. Holland. Remember I told you to remember S.M. Holland? Standing on the overpass, looking down. He gives you a scenario. Eyewitness, ear witness. Precisely the timing and direction of the acoustics and his testimony is corroborated by everything that the Warren Commission did on to how many shots from which direction. They say two from behind. We say two from behind. They say this two from behind. We say the exactly the same two from behind. We don't disagree. The disagreement comes on when the first one occurs and whether there's one from the grassy knoll. But look what you have to accept to accept his analysis. You have to reject all four, not just the one from the grassy knoll. And if you buy three of them as corroborated, you're backed into buying the fourth one as corroborated. Tell me, professor, what's the chance that random static in a period of six minutes would fit? If you go down these facts, the time span is appropriate. The impulse patterns are unique. They correspond with the gunshots we did in Dealey Plaza. They match a moving microphone at approximately 11 miles an hour. Three shots match the depository. Two shots match the Z film. I'll show you in a minute a photograph of the microphone on the mic in the place where he has to be. We didn't know that he was there. The acoustic said he should be there. If he's not, we're in trouble. We looked and he was there. Those Harley David motorcycle had windshields in the front. And depending on where the motorbike was and where the gun was, the windshield was either in front of the, of the gun or behind the gun. And it distorted the sound accordingly. The distortion based on the windshield shows up in the waveforms. You have to have on this static an in wave, a supersonic wave at the front for Oswald's shots because Oswald fired a supersonic rifle. But if you understand the cone down from the depository, it would not necessarily show up on them all. The presence of the end wave is appropriate. It is consistent with Governor Conley's testimony. It is consistent with the trajectory analysis and is corroborated by the other witnesses. This is McLean coming up this street, and I want you to notice, contrary to what the good professor from UCLA indicated, there's no crowd in the way here. And I'll show you the film in a minute. He is not obstructed at any time. This is McLean turning the corner. Which corner, Bob? This is the corner of, this is Maine coming this way, and this is Houston coming this way. This is this corner right here. Back there where the crowd is, you mean? On Maine. There is no crowd in here, Jim, that in, Houston. In, interferes with this. Wait till you get around it and you'll see it. Here is McLean in the appropriate place in the plaza based on the, on the film. And here is good old H.B. McLean in our hearings. What am I going to do about his testimony? Like many of the witnesses who lived through this six seconds, their memory is bad, their perception was bad, and their testimony is bad. Go to the physical evidence first. Make sure it coheres, then go to the other testimony. What I'd like to do for you now is call on this jury to make up its own mind. Don't just take my word for it. When you hear something, you hear it with your eyes. When you see something, you hear it with your ears. The mind puts it together. Studies of eyes show that you don't see peripherally. The mind reconstructs that. In point of fact, you see a small point out in front. The rest is constructed by your mind. What I'm asking you to do is you be a witness to those tragic six seconds in Dallas. 
I want to play for you a tape that is a composite. I will take you up the uh, Houston, around uh, up Main, around Houston, around on Elm, and we have sunk the sounds of the assassination on the film in the appropriate places. Don't misunderstand me. These are not the sounds recorded in 1963. You can't recover those. What Jim did with you is a cheap law professor trick. That's a third generation tape. It's an unfiltered tape. You've got to exclude the, mic, mic, the uh, motorcycle background to it before you can get it up to the point it was audible. If he had played you the audible tape, you can in fact distinguish it and hear it. What he's played is an unfiltered tape. It's a third generation. I didn't make a motion to, to exclude it. The judge would have excluded it as not the best evidence, but I didn't want to interrupt him. I wanted to be polite. What I now want to do is let you be the judge. Dave, would you play the tape? This is up the street. Notice the absence of crowd in here. Cops standing there uh, uh, prohibiting it. The car moving around, not slowing down, going 10 miles an hour. You be the witness. Don't listen to the law professor. This is the turning. Now we go into Zabruder and listen. Would you stop it, Dave, please? Do you see how difficult it is to listen and, and watch and try to remember it? Let me give you as witnesses an opportunity that none of the witnesses there had the opportunity to do. Let's play it again. Back it up, Dave. Stop it, re go forward. You can get a chance to see the tantalizing question. Can you see Oswald here? Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Lieber can respond briefly. I want you to notice, first of all, that Professor Blakey addressed basically the, <clears throat> the timing question, and then <clears throat> some additional questions, but he never addressed the question <clears throat> of the sounds of the motorcycle and the and the sounds, first the sound of the crowd coming down Main Street. It's quite, quite agreed there was no crowd on Houston Street, but the motorcycle had been running for two minutes down Main Street before it turned that corner. And we listened to the tape, and there isn't a single crowd sound on that tape. And the engine is running at a speed that is entirely inconsistent with a motorcycle moving as it did uh, from two to four miles an hour and stopping several times as it came down Main Street before it turned the corner onto Houston Street and then onto Elm Street. <clears throat> the other point is that there, there's no explanation of the siren sounds and there's no explanation of the fact. I have a transcript here that was made by Sheriff Bowles of the sounds on the tape and he didn't use a third generation tape that appeared on the tape during a time that McLean was speeding to Parkland Hospital and what he reports is, is he hears the motorcycle engine slowed to idle speed, motorcycle engine at very slow idle, motorcycle slowed to idle. <clears throat> the House Committee and their acoustic experts could have done a voice print or a sound print of McLean's motorcycle and compared it to the motorcycle on this tape. They didn't do it. In the face of all the evidence there was in this tape that it was the wrong motorcycle in the wrong place, it wasn't until three years later that Blakey suggested that they address this question. Did the NSF uh, panel just, do just one, a minute. Tim? Wait a second. No, let's, let's just be No, no, the no, panel? no. But I'd be glad to join with you in asking somebody to do it. I How's that? Too. Okay, fine. Now, please be polite, Bob. <laughs> <Finish> <clears throat> 
There's one thing, one other thing that I want. Bob suggests the relationship between the sound of the printer tape and the impulse patterns cannot be random. Of course it's not random. The Ballistics Acoustics Committee pointed out that when you look at the waveforms during this period of time, <clears throat> the acoustics experts picked out waveforms that were much less pronounced, much smaller than other similar ones on the tape, and did not tell us why they picked out the less pronounced waveforms as opposed to the more pronounced waveforms. But of course, one possibility is that they were guided by the knowledge of what the Zapruder film showed. That's always a possibility, and I suggest that. There's one other thing. Is it possible the that they were honest people? Doing well, the best I understand that. So am I an honest person, Bob. How can we disagree? <laughs> let, I don't understand it. You just haven't it. talked to let, me long let, enough. Let, let him, it, I'll let you respond in about one minute. Go ahead. When, when he played the sound of the shots, and I wanted to mention this, I have this written up, but I didn't have time to do it. I hope you noticed how close the first two shots were together. 1.57 seconds between his first shot and his second shot. 1.66. <clears throat> 1.57 in my book, but I won't quibble. <laughs> the FBI said the rifle could not be fired in less than 2.3 seconds. <clears throat> but Blakey's coherence has now got it down to 1.66 or 1.57 seconds. The House Committee hired a group of experts to go out in the Virginia woods here to see how fast they could fire the rifle, and not one of them could hit anything or even fire it in 1.66 seconds. Bob Blakey is apparently, and Cornwall, somebody else, I don't know who these people were, but I understand that one of them, my friend Bob over here, was able to get off a shot in less than 1.57 or 1.66 seconds by point aiming. The difference between the FBI 2.3 and the uh, faster shot that uh, some other people got off is that the FBI used the scope and the other people used the iron sights. But nobody could get off a shot <clears throat> at this rapid speed of 1.57 or 1.66 seconds, unless they just point aim, that is, they just shot in the general direction. If you think that the rifle was fired that quickly and that the sounds in this tape are consistent <clears throat> with a motorcycle that was in the motorcade, which is simply impossible, <clears throat> then I guess you have to accept Professor Blakey's story. But I, as a farm boy, listened to that motorcycle first time I heard it, and I laughed out loud. It's a little flathead three-wheel traffic scooter is what it is that was on its way back from a, from a job to cut off cross traffic on the motorcade route to the trademark where the Dallas Police Department had a motor pool for all of the motorcycles and scooters that were doing this job. All right, and Sheriff me. Bowles would testify we're here, here today that it was not McLean's motorcycle all right. who had the open microphone. Professor Blake, you'd like to just wrap it up, please, for quickly. Let me, uh, that was not part of the agreement. I know, but I'm going to give well, a couple me, seconds. Let me, since he's introduced me as a witness, it's appropriate that I not only have a cross-examination, but a direct. Well, you can testify as well, Bob. That's all right. Oh, I don't care. What happened is uh, the acoustics obviously present uh, a timing problem. If the uh, Warren Commission on 2.25 is correct, then the acoustics is wrong. Uh, incidentally, if the acoustics is right on, on 1.66 seconds, and it's impossible to fire within that range, it may be that we're wrong on the single bullet theory, too. And there are two, two shooters, or, or by two gunmen from behind. That's another possibility that Jim didn't entertain. So we recognize that the 1.66 seconds presented a real problem for us if we wanted to buy the single bullet theory. We went out and did test studies. And this is a classic study in dealing with people. We got some guys from the local PD. They were all marksmen. They went out and we reconstructed on the DC uh, uh, firing range, three targets. And we said, don't use the scope. Try for speed, not accuracy. See how many you can get off and also hit them. But we're worried about speed, not accuracy. I've never seen a bunch of more macho guys in my life. Every single one of them wanted to guarantee he hit the three targets. They went for accuracy, not speed. And Cornwall and I criticized them for it. And I said, look, we're not going to tell anybody that you missed a target. And they were macho. I will not miss a target. Whereupon Cornwall and I, who used rifles when we were in high school, he used rifles currently, took the guns away from them. And we had a limited amount of ammunition, so we had no other choice. And I proceeded to go for speed, not accuracy, and did it in 
two seconds and hit one out of three. And I'll tell you, I've used rifles all my life. That's not impossible. And if I had the opportunity to work with it, I could do it regularly. And so could Gary. That's the testimony. Second comment is, is just as follows. Understand what's at issue. If the scenario of the NSF panel is correct, the three the shots, the four point. shots, they're gone. If the corroboration that we've given you between the film and the tape, between the eyewitnesses and the, and the tape, between the autopsy and the tape, for three of the shots are correct, it's true for the fourth as well. What he never answered is the chance that random static would have produced such coordination between the film and the tape. I suggest to you it requires a degree of credibility in excess of this that this jury ought to have to not believe the, the, the scenario of the uh, acoustics. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Blakey. Uh, we want to uh, thank all of uh, the people who participated uh, in this program. You can imagine that they've come from a great distance. They've spent a lot of time preparing for this. You've seen some things here, I think, that have occurred for the first time uh, in a public forum. Uh, we've given you an opportunity, I think, to see what is the state of the art in, in the preparation and presentation of demonstrative and forensic evidence in a trial-type setting, uh, both in terms of uh, lawyers uh, giving opening and closing type uh, remarks and with respect to uh, the examination of witnesses. So again, uh, and Judge, I certainly want to thank you for giving up your time uh, today to be here, and uh, you've certainly uh, added uh, a big dimension to it, and a special word of thanks to Dave Muir and the people at FTI for all of their help. Uh, so again, uh, we want to thank you for uh, your attention, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Have the cross examination, Mr. Liebler. All right. I want to start with the question of the head movement uh, that you uh, just testified about, Dr. Weck. Uh, you testified that uh, that uh, at frames 312 and 313, when the uh, it was a Twitter film, would you clear the screen, please? <coughs> of the Zapruder film that the president's head and body moved sharply to the, well, to it's, the it's, rear, it's, is that correct? It, it, it's, it's right after 313. Uh, the, the it moved sharply to the, to the rear. You can yes, answer that yeah, question yeah, yes or no, uh, Dr. Weck. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you can answer that question yes or no. At frame 313, you testify at frame 313, and, and at frame 313, when the president was struck with the bullet, that the head and body moved sharply backwards. Well, it's 314, because 313 is a crimson burst that obscures uh, actual um, definitive interpretation, I would say 314. <clears throat> would you put, so you can't say, is your testimony that you can't tell where the, where the head moved at frame 313? I, I can't testify about that abrupt movement from 313 alone. That's my testimony. <clears throat> like number, exhibit number 22. Exhibit number 22 is a chart showing the movement of the president's head and body at or about and, and after the Pruder frame 313. And according to the representation in this chart, when the line moves to the right, as you look at it, that's an indication of a forward movement. <clears throat> and when the line moves to the left, that's an indication of a backward movement of the president's head and body. The Pruder frame 313 is right here, where the, where the pointer is. And we see, according to this chart here, that there's a sharp but very brief, <clears throat> it's not as sharp as the later movement, but there is a forward movement, brief forward movement of the president's head immediately after the time that he was struck by the bullet at frame 312 and frame 313. <clears throat> and you see that from the, from the, from the, from the I, exhibit up there, I, Dr. Weck? I, I see the curved line, yes. 
Well, the testimony is there's stipulation that, that that is what this chart shows, so I'll assume that that's what it shows, whether you agree with me that it shows that or not. <clears throat> it shows a sharp but, but brief movement forward immediately after the time the president was shot, and then a much larger movement backwards. Do you have some explanation for how the pres why the president's head <clears throat> moved forward immediately uh, at the time it was struck? I'm not familiar with this kind of a, of a study. I really don't know uh, who, who, who did this and what that period of time is for that um, movement of the line depicting uh, supposedly the movement of the president to the right, what that period of time is. Um, well, it's one or two frames right in there. You can see it, one, two frames of the president's head moving forward, many, and then it's going to move two, backwards. Two frames is what you're saying? <clears throat> I think that's what it looks like, yeah, about yeah, two, two frames, frames three frames uh, one, most. One, one ninth of a second. Mm -hmm. No, I have no uh, explanation for that, but it doesn't alter my opinion <coughs> uh, in terms of the very strong and much more prolonged movement uh, backward. So you have no explanation for why, if this chart is correct, which we stipulate here that the council, I believe that it is correct, as to why the president's head moves forward for a very brief period of time before it started to move backwards. No, <coughs> Let me so ask you this, Dr. Weck. Would it be <coughs> uh, about, uh, look, do, you, do you have any idea how much uh, a momentum would be impact, would be imparted to the president's head the time he was struck by the, well, you by the bolts the, of the Manlick or Carcano? The uh, basic uh, formula of uh, force equaling one-half mass times velocity squared, and you take the mass of the bullet and the velocity of the bullet and that'll give you uh, the 18 force. 18.4 pound, 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 pound feet, approximately. Uh, I represent that as being accurate. We accept that, does it sound right? If, <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to argue, if, if that's been accepted by counsel, I, I, uh, then, then fine. If in fact the bullet imparted a momentum of 18.4 pound feet to the president's head, do you have any idea how much net velocity that that would uh, impart to the president's head in the direction of the bullet? since we're, the momentum here is, con is conserved, I'm not going to lose any. If the, the bullet hits the president in the back of the head, if it did that, <clears throat> it would impart a certain momentum to it, and that would impart, in turn, a sort of a net velocity to the president's head. Y yes, velocity would be imparted to his head. I agree. Yes. <clears throat> I, 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 sound, would you accept the proposition that <clears throat> this bullet, that this bullet struck at the speed that it was moving at when it hit the president's head, that it would impart, produce a net velocity in the direction of the bullet of 1.2 feet per second in the head in the direction of the bullet travels. I, I, I won't accept that unless, again, it's something that everybody has stipulated to. <clears throat> I, I, we I, have I, stipulated I, that if Mr. Larry Sturdivan, a physical scientist, an expert in this from the Aberdeen Proving Ground Vulnerability Laboratory, were present, he would testify precisely as I have just indicated. No, I won't stipulate to that, Mr. Liebler. Uh, I'm aware of Mr. Sturdivant's role. I'm also aware of his affiliation uh, with the federal government and until Dr. Reck, I'm not time asking you to stipulate to this. I'm telling you that there is a stipulation that if Mr. Sturdivan was here, he would so testify. Oh, that he That's would testify. That's all you have to know. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Then I'll use the word accept. I, right. I'm sorry, rather than stipulate. And I will not <coughs> accept the um, unquestioned, unchallenged testimony of a federal person in this investigation unless and until such time as similar experiments have been performed <coughs> by people who have no affiliation with the federal government. All right, let me say again, Dr. Weck, I'm not asking you to accept it. I'm just telling you that that would be the testimony if Mr. Sturdivant was here. Are you in a position to, to uh, just suggest that the testimony is wrong on the merits, on the numbers that I've given you here? I thought I was just saying that I'm not in a position to to accept no or i didn't reject. ask you that the question is well, do you have any basis that. on which to challenge these numbers i just told you the basis the basis is mr sturdivant's affiliation with the federal government that's my basis <clears throat> would you put uh, exhibit uh, 128 on the screen please We have on the screen, can you zero? Yes, well, I'll, let me read. Uh, this, this is the testimony that uh, Mr. Sturdivan would give if he was here, and testimony that he, would, that he gave before the House Committee on this question. He first indicates in paragraph one <coughs> that the bullet <coughs> that struck the president in the back of the head deposited about 18.4 pound feet of momentum upon impact. In paragraph two, that produced a net velocity of 1.2 feet per second in the head in the direction of the bullet's travel. 
and that explains the movement to the right, the movement forward that we saw in the head right immediately following frames 313 in the Zapruder film that we saw in the last exhibit. Quoting Sturtevant, paragraph three, <clears throat> this velocity of 1.2 feet per second is not the kind of velocity that would throw the president bodily around backwards, forwards, or in any other direction, <clears throat> no matter which direction the bullet came from. The deposit of momentum from the bullet is not from is not sufficient to cause any dramatic movement in any direction. It would have a very slight movement. <clears throat> Assuming the bullet hit him in the back of the head, it would have a slight movement toward the front, which would very rapidly be damped by the connection of the neck with the body. In other words, the head would begin to move, and then the body would be dragged forward with it at a much lower velocity, certainly not a very large velocity, not throwing anybody anywhere. And in the last paragraph, paragraph four, the president's backward motion is a neuromuscular reaction. Nerves can be stimulated by mechanical means. The bullet striking the president's skull caused mechanical stimulation of the motor nerves of the president. And since all motor nerves were stimulated at the same time, then every muscle in the body would be activated at the same time. Now in an arm, for instance, this would have activated the biceps muscle, but it would also have activated the triceps muscle, muscle, which being more powerful would have straightened the arm out. The muscles in the back of the trunk are much stronger than the abdominals, and therefore the body would arch backwards. <clears throat> Now, concerning the, the head movement, you testified as to three different... Are we good to strike that? Right. Question I'm or sorry? Is there, is there a question after that statement? <coughs> what the I'm reading the evidence of the... Uh, yes. said. <coughs> All right. did, you have, uh, did you ever uh, read Mr. Sturdivant's testimony before the House Committee? Uh, yes, I read it. <coughs> so you're familiar with the fact that he gave this testimony? Yes. Thank you, Dr. White. <coughs> In... Uh, in testifying on the, uh, on the reason why you thought there was a shot from the front, <clears throat> you gave three reasons. One is the head movement, and uh, <clears throat> the other related to x-rays. And I want to uh, read the following from your testimony that you gave before the House Committee, and I'll ask you if you gave this testimony. Question by Mr. Purdy. Dr. Wecht. What evidence is there which supports the possibility that there was a shot from the side or from the front lower right rear? Dr. Wecht, very meager, and the possibility based on the existing evidence is extremely remote. <clears throat> there is a small piece of some material that is present at the base of the external scalp, just above the hairline, <clears throat> which has never been commented on before except by me following the 1972 investigation of the material at the archives and later commented upon by other forensic pathology panel, by the forensic pathology panel. There is a total deformation of the right side of the cranial vault with extensive fractures of the cal calvarium. <clears throat> Did you come to that conclusion by examining the x-rays, Dr. Weck? Uh, x-rays and pictures that were you, you, made available, yes. Yes or no, you examined the x-rays. The x-rays would show that. X-rays and, and pictures, yes. The x-rays would show that by themselves, would they not? Yes. Thank you, Dr. White. <clears throat> Has there been any change in the x-rays since that time? There uh, have been uh, serious questions raised, yes, as I've already indicated, about the authenticity <clears throat> of the x-rays. The x-rays have been altered as well as the photographs. Some of the photographs and x-rays, yes, have been. So the x-rays themselves, have been, would you tell us which x-rays have, have been altered? The uh, uh, x-rays of the cranial vault are not consistent with uh, the descriptions given by the various physicians at Parkland Hospital, Shaw, McClellan, Perry, uh, Crenshaw, uh, Kemp Clark, and others, uh, nor indeed by um, Humes and Boswell um, on the night of the autopsy. Well, Dr. Weck, my question was, what evidence you have that the x-rays were altered? You told me that they're inconsistent with somebody's testimony. Oh, I told you. That does not suggest that the x-rays were altered. The x-rays? Yes, if, the x-rays uh, or the x-rays of it. 
Look at the x-ray. Show me some internal evidence in the x-ray. It's uh, been altered. That's the question. I'm, I'm, I'll answer your question, Mr. Lieber. No. If court is still in session next week, then we will have the entire presentation made by Mr. Tom Wilson that will show you exactly with scientific precision that they have been altered. <clears throat> That's the evidence. But so far, there's no evidence that, the, uh, that we know of that the x-rays have been altered. Well, I don't know what's going to happen, how long the trial is going to go <clears throat> on. Well, as of today, Dr. Weck, the question is, is there any evidence suggesting the x-rays have been altered? I'm not asking what's going to happen next week. As of well, now. Yes, there is evidence. It, is, it exists. And it exists in the form of other evidence that has been set forth by other people who have also conducted investigative studies and which is set forth in their published works. I refer you to Mr. Harrison Livingston's High Treason. I refer you to work that has been done by other people in the Texas area. Uh, by photographic work done by other people, as well as the work that has been done by Mr. Tom Wilson. This work is extant as we sit this here is, today. This is physical evidence that the x ray Yes, it sure is physical evidence. All right, fine. <clears throat> so the third point was that the x-rays have been altered. Of course, if the x-rays have been altered since the time you gave your testimony, then we'll have to uh, leave that question. I want to call Dr. We Dr. Uh, Bodden on redirect to deal with that question. Uh, all right, I want to go next to the uh, question of the, uh, the uh, condition of the bullet. Um, 399 goes to the uh, single bullet theory. <clears throat> and I wanted to ask you first if uh, the bullet 399 could have entered the president's back and, entered and exited his throat without suffering any more uh, deformation than was shown uh, in the picture of the uh, uh, bullet we had up before. You can put 107 on the screen if you would, please, it shows the bullet. <coughs> this is 399. Could that bullet, bullet have gone through the president's to uh, enter the back and exit the throat without being deformed any more than that? Could it, could it have? The yes. answer is yes. Yeah. Could it have gone through Governor Connolly's <clears throat> chest alone and suffered no more deformation than shown in this exhibit? Uh, no. No. <clears throat> no. Give me the book back. Not destroying 10 centimeters of the rib. You gave testimony before the House committee, <clears throat> and uh, you were asked uh, <clears throat> by Mr. Cornwell, I'll read the question. Let's again use the hypothetical of just going through the governor's chest. Could it have gone through the chest alone, nothing else, and suffered no more deformation, in your opinion, than 399? <clears throat> you answered, <clears throat> you mean after emerging from the president's neck? Tell me, uh, and uh, Cornwell said, either way or both, if the hypothetical varies, tell me both ways. Dr. Weck, I do not believe it could have gone through Governor Connolly's chest because the horizontal and vertical trajectories would not have permitted the course of the bullet, that course for the bullet, which I'm not addressing now, of course. I'm only addressing the condition of the bullet. We'll come back to the question of trajectories. And Mr. Cornwell said, I'm not talking about trajectories. I'm just talking about if a bullet went through the chest alone. Dr. Weck, in a hypothetical situation, Mr. Cornwell, yes, sir. Dr. Weck, doing what we believe the bullet did in President Kennedy's upper chest in the neck area, and then doing what we know the bullet to have done in Governor John Connolly's chest. Is that your question? Mr. Cornwell, let's assume the trajectory is lined up for purposes of discussion. Dr. Weck, the answer is, it gets back to what Mr. Purdy asked me. The answer is, I think, it would be possible for a bullet to have emerged with a relatively minimal degree of deformity, having gone through these two parts of the human anatomy of two human beings, being those two parts being the president's <clears throat> back and exiting his neck and going through Governor Connolly's chest. Now, are you going to change your testimony from what you gave then? Yes, that's correct. Based upon the two experiments that have been done since that time, by, that I became aware of by Professor Nichols and by Mr. Howard and by further studies, that's correct. I do not believe that it would have <coughs> been possible. And the All government's uh, refusal right, to repeat the experiment through animal cadavers is indeed uh, indirectly uh, confirmatory for me. <clears throat> Dr. Weck, I want to ask you just to do me a favor. When I ask you a question, try to answer the question. 
I am answering and, your question. And not give me a lecture on something else. I just I'm not you giving you a lecture, Mr. Lieber. I'm not in your classroom you. either, I Mr. Lieber. I didn't ask I'm you. I'm not a law student right, now. Counsel, okay, you're not a professor. Counsel, Mr. Uh, well, we'll bring the Dr. judge Dr. into this in a counsel, moment. Counsel, Dr. Reich, let's just uh, stick to the questions and answer, not debate with each other. It doesn't help the uh, evidence in the case. <clears throat> Do you think that 399 could have got, inflicted the wound to Governor Connolly's side that it did without suffering any deformity? Any more deformity than is shown on the exhibit that's up to, there? To the thigh? <clears throat> is that, is that your, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your word. thigh, thigh. yes, to the thigh. It's, nothing else, just into the thigh? That's right. Yes, that's all. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, I've got in my hand, I don't know if I can get over there, show it to you, but I've got in my hand a, a shell. It is a, hmm? Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> that Dr. Bodden will uh, show you. I want it back right away, so just let him look at it. Go and get it. <clears throat> I'm being a professor now, and Dr. Bodden is being my student. <clears throat> You've examined this uh, shell, Dr. Weck? Uh, yes. It is a fully copper jacketed shell, is it not? Yes. <clears throat> and uh, CE399 was also a fully jacketed copper shell, was it not? Yes. <clears throat> except, Pardon? except except that it's base. Pardon? Except that it's base. <clears throat> if I were to drop this bullet on the podium here, <clears throat> you wouldn't expect that it would uh, deform. No. Or if I threw it <clears throat> at somebody's bone, let's say, in his wrist, or <clears throat> in some other part of his anatomy, <clears throat> and threw it as hard as I could, and it struck say your wrist, you wouldn't expect it to deform. Uh, you mean if you, if, you, if, if you threw it? If I threw it. Uh, no, no, no. <clears throat> so there's a velocity, and the reason, of course, it wouldn't deform is because it's not going fast enough. Is that right? Uh, well, well, yes, it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't penetrate. penetrate. That's right. So there's a velocity below which <clears throat> a bullet thrown at, uh, thrown at, at uh, a bone or a wrist, at, at, in, in a wrist, <clears throat> or at anything else would not deform because it's going too slow. It has to reach a certain speed before <clears throat> the bullet will deform. Now, if also, if I, you would agree with me, would you not, if I threw the bullet at your wrist and hit you in the wrist, that it wouldn't break your wrist either. It wouldn't fracture the bone, wrist bone in your, bone in your wrist. Uh, I, I agree. Right, so there's a certain speed at which the bullet's going to have to be going before <clears throat> it would fracture the wrist. Yes. Now, I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Supposing <clears throat> that we had testimony <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that a bullet similar to 399 <clears throat> would shatter a wrist bone, a bone like a wrist, at any speed in excess of 700 feet per second. That's the first basis of the hypothetical question. <clears throat> and suppose that we had testimony that a bullet like 399, <clears throat> if traveling nose on straight into this bone, this wrist bone, <clears throat> would not begin to deform until it reached a speed in excess of 1,400 feet per second. That's the second basis of the hypothetical. <clears throat> and we have additional testimony indicating that if the bullet were to hit the wrist bone going sideways, <clears throat> under which more stress would be placed on it, that it would not begin to deform <clears throat> until it reached <clears throat> a speed of 1,000 feet per second. If these three things are, are true, I'm not asking whether they're true or not, let's just understand that. And I just really want a yes or no answer, if I can possibly get it from this question. <clears throat> if these three propositions are true, that the wrist will shatter <clears throat> when a bullet hits it at any speed of over 700 feet per second, and that the bullet will not begin to deform unless it's moving in excess of 1,000 to 1,400 feet per second, then there would be a gap, would there not, Dr. Weck? <clears throat> between which or in, in which the bullet striking the wrist could fracture the wrist, wrist and not deform, would there not? Yes or no, doctor? Well, well you have to do is subtract. No, 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 yes no, or no. I, uh, no but, but you, haven't no. Fact, you haven't talked about bone. Pardon? 
You haven't talked about bone. You just talked about the wrist. No, no. I don't the know whether you mean the wrist bone. Well, will well you said the wrist. Feet per second. So you're talking about through the bone, or fracturing the bone. Right. Uh, well, under your hypothetical, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's right. Uh, yeah, the, using yeah. those those numbers. Yeah. The answer is yes. <clears throat> now you have reviewed, Doctor uh, Doctor Doctor Weck. You've already testified that you reviewed. <clears throat> I'd like Exhibit 127, please that you have read uh, Mr. Sturtevant's testimony <coughs> uh, before the, uh, the House Committee, and it's shown on the board here, <coughs> and Mr. Sturtevant testified at that time, did he not, <coughs> that they, the bullet, a bullet like 399 is four times stronger than human bone, that striking bone nose on, a bullet will begin to deform at about 1,400 feet per second as speed rises, <clears throat> and sideways it will deform down to about a thousand feet per second <clears throat> that the <clears throat> uh, in number eight that the bullet would fracture a wrist bone at any speed above 700 feet per second and additional additionally dr. Sturdivant mr. Sturdivant estimated the speeds at which the bullet was moving when it went when it hit governor Conley's wrist <clears throat> he testified it was moving at 2,000 feet per second when it left the muzzle that when it hit the president after it exits from the president's throat it slowed down <clears throat> about 100 feet per second, that it, when it went through Governor Connolly's chest, it slowed down about 400 feet per second, so it estimated its velocity at somewhere between 1,100 and 1,300 feet per second when it exited Gov Governor Connolly's chest. You're aware of that testimony, are you not, Dr. Weck? You've lost yes me or no. the math. Wait, 100 and, read 400, the testimony. 100 and 400 is 500. Subtracting 500 <clears throat> from 2,000 is 1,500. You the question down is, to The question is, are you aware of the fact that Mr. Sturdivant gave the testimony I just referred to? Yes or no? I don't care about yes his no. testimony. I, I'm talking about math. You asked me before, <clears throat> can I not subtract? No, so the I'm question does not subtract. involve arithmetic. It involves the question of whether you are aware of the fact that he gave this testimony. Yes or no? Am I aware that he gave the testimony? Yes. Thank yes. you, Dr. Wack. Yeah. I'm also aware that he's Thank you, Dr. Wack. in his life. All right. <clears throat> I need the trajectory file over there. The both the, the yeah. <clears throat> Exhibit one ten, please. You testified earlier, Dr. Weck, did you not, that this reflected the movement of the bullet across the car, the presidential limousine? <clears throat> yes, as a possibility. As to, <clears throat> as to what might have happened to the bullet. How did you come to the conclusion that this is, my, that this, that this is the, uh, <clears throat> the way the, uh, the bullet went? Objection, Your Honor. He has twice mischaracterized this witness's view of this exhibit. All right. I'll also state he testified it's a possibility. You can ask him why he thinks it's a possibility. He didn't testify that's definitively where the way the bullet went. How did you come to the conclusion that this is one possible way that the bullet moved, Dr. Weck? It shows Kennedy, Conley, even moves Conley in a little bit uh, toward the left side, uh, further in than I believe he really was, as he picked up his Pruder film. And then we've got a line coming through Kennedy's back and out the uh, midline of his neck, and uh, the bullet then could have moved in such a fashion as to have missed Conley completely. I understand, and, but how did you come to the conclusion that this, this could have happened? I mean, did you look at the Zapruder film? What did you look at? I understand what the thing shows. What, how did you come to the conclusion? Did you draw that? No, that's not my drawing. <clears throat> you believe that drawing is correct? It's reasonably correct. It's not, I don't think it's precise. Um, down no. to the literal degree, not, but I'm I think not, it's, it's reasonably accurate. I'm not going to hold you to that. I just want you to know how you came to the conclusion that this exhibit shows a possibility as, as to what happened to the bullet. I don't know who prepared that, but I've seen it for many years. <clears throat> how did you come to the conclusion that it shows a possibility? Because it's a straight line, and bullets move in a straight line. Could have gone in any direction at all? Pardon me? Dr. Weck, did you look at the Zapruder film in, in, in deciding that this was a possibility? Yeah, yes, correlating what else the Zapruder film with, with this, yes. What else did you look at? The, 
hospital records, the sketches, the autopsy uh, report, um, the limousine, all of these things. Okay, fine. <clears throat> You're aware of the fact that uh, that the House Committee established a uh, photographic evidence panel, are you not? Yes. And they studied this question of uh, the trajectory and the movement of the shot? Yes. <clears throat> and do you know what conclusion they came to? Uh, not um, specifically or not in detail. <clears throat> uh, put uh, exhibit one six two uh, uh, 116 on the screen, please. <clears throat> The report of the House Committee, by way of background to this exhibit, Dr. Weck, indicates that they had uh, analyzed, and this is on uh, page 18 of volume uh, 6 of the House Committee, to which we stipulated, uh, that they analyzed the Zapruder frames in three dimensions as stereo pairs between uh, 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 certain uh, Zapruder 187 and 193. Uh, so that uh, looked, uh, looked as though you could have, you give depth perception to it. If you do the stereoscopy, pairs, it's just like looking at them through the eye. It's a single, a single frame of film is a one dimension, taking one dimension, putting two of these together, you can make it look as though it has depth perception. <clears throat> and after the, uh, after uh, analyzing the Zapruder film uh, on uh, that basis and uh, by using some of the other films that they, uh, that showed the uh, motorcade from the other side, the Croft and Betzner uh, films and doing a photogrammetric analysis, they came up with this picture. This is what the House Photographic Panel <coughs> portrays as the positions of Governor <coughs> Connolly right here and President Kennedy. <coughs> Governor Connolly has turned to his right at this point and uh, <coughs> looking back presumably after he heard the first shot <coughs> and the uh, House Committee concluded that that was an accurate representation of the location <coughs> of President uh, Kennedy and Governor Connolly uh, in the automobile. Are you aware of that? Uh, am I aware of what, sir? That, that, that the House Committee came to the conclusion that that diagram right there is an accurate representation of the location of President Kennedy and President Connolly in the car. That that was their conclusion? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> you know what the vote of the, uh, of the uh, photographic panel was on that question? No, I know something uh, more than the vote. I know what no, Mr. No, Robert just Groden... Yes no, just yes or no. Uh, no, Mr. No, Robert no. Groden totally no, no, repudiates that. No, 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 Dr. Weck, Your Honor, would you please try All again? Right. All right, just to answer the question. No, no, I don't know the vote. get a chance to give rebuttal later. Yes, I don't know the vote. <clears throat> vote was 15 to 1 that this was the ac an accurate representation of the uh, position of the president <clears throat> and the uh, governor in the automobile. <clears throat> I'd like you to put... Uh, I'm running out of time, so what I'm going to have to do is, is ask, yes, is ask uh, is ask you to put uh, exhibit 14 on the screen. <clears throat> 